Hi everyone, and welcome back to the lab. In this video, I'll be distilling diethyl ether from a store-bought product. You can actually make diethyl ether using the dehydration of ethanol with, say, sulfuric acid or something, which is good for uh, pedagogical purposes, I suppose, but it's way too expensive for me to do it that way, so I'm going to do it this way, and I'll demonstrate that dehydration reaction of alcohols um, in a later video. Anyway, diethyl ether is a good organic solvent. It's fairly nonpolar, so it will layer out in water after a few percent, and uh, it has a very low boiling point of only 34 and a half Celsius, which kind of makes it hard to deal with since it's uh, both extremely flammable and very volatile at room temperature because of its low boiling point. And uh, so you have to be careful when you're working with it. Always use good ventilation, etc. Diethyl ether is uh, commonly found in a product called starting fluid, which you may know of. It's used to start engines. Actually, this is the Spanish side. So uh, in the English side, uh, Johnson's Premium start Starting Fluid. I tend to use this stuff because it's cheap and it's 50% ether. They advertise that on the outside. And if you look at the MSDS, it's actually 50 to 70% diethyl ether, which is really cool. And the other components, uh, we have petroleum gases, liquefied, sweetened, uh, branched, cyclic, and, and heptane, carbon dioxide, um, and then toluene as major components. So anyway, uh, some of those things might be difficult to separate from the ether, you might think, so let's just look and see. So the diethyl ether itself boils at 34 and a half Celsius. The uh, petroleum gases, the liquefied sweetened entry there, uh, lists anywhere between uh, minus 40 and plus 80 Celsius, so that one could prove to be a problem. Uh, and then we have the, the branched cyclic and end heptane, which uh, all have ranges between 90 and 98 degrees Celsius, so that won't be a problem. We'll easily separate that from the 34 that uh, ether boils at, and the toluene will be no problem either. Now, I looked deeper into this uh, petroleum gases entry here, and uh, if you look at the technical data sheet that the Johnson's product gives, they say that its, propelled, its propellant here is uh, A85. I'm not really sure... What 80, I didn't really know anyway what A85 was, so I looked it up, and it turns out a company called Aeron makes aerosol propellants of a mixture of propane and isobutane, and A85 is a 62.73 weight percent propane to isobutane uh, mixture with a vapor pressure of right around 85 psi at uh, well, uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And here's the MSDS for the Aeron A85 confirming that. Anyway, so if you look at those two ingredients, they both boil at uh, minus 42 and then uh, somewhere between minus 9 and minus 13, uh, respectively. So those should be very easy to separate, and that accounts for uh, pretty much all of this uh, second entry here. So no worries there. Anyway, long story short, it should be fairly easy to separate all the diethyl ether quite effectively from the starting fluid using a few basic pieces of apparatus and uh, a little bit of time. Um, I'm using this starting fluid because, uh, like I said, it's cheap, and uh, as a last point, if you, I did the math, and uh, if this is 50% by weight ether and we had 100% recovery, I bought a case of 12 of these things, and uh, that comes to $11.46 for each liter of diethyl ether, which is just ridiculously cheap. You can't get it anywhere for that price. So anyway, that's why uh, I'm going to do this now, and I'll show you how it's done. So I've set up here with a two neck, one liter round bottom flask with a gas inlet adapter here. And uh, what that's gonna allow me to do is to stick a straw, which I can attach to this can and uh, run the straw down in there just to minimize the amount that escapes into the room. I'm gonna chill this can to, uh, or at least I've got several cans in, in the freezer anyway. Uh, I'm gonna chill it to minus, minus 20 Celsius. It's as cold as my freezer goes. And that's gonna help prevent uh, a lot of the volatilization that will happen right off the bat when this stuff boils. Um, I'm going to squirt it at minus 20 Celsius from here, and it'll start boiling at room temperature. It'll, it'll start boiling at minus 20 since it's propelled by CO2, and that A85 stuff uh, has components in it that boil lower than that. So that'll begin to boil, but we want to boil it as slowly as possible because that will help um, with efficient separation using this Vigro column. And what's going to happen is as the stuff boils at room temperature in the flask, the uh, Vigro column is going to give a second chance for all that ether to uh, and heptanes and everything else that have lower boiling points than the uh, propellant to condense and fall back down into the flask. It'll help with that separation because remember, uh, just like steam distillation where a heavy high boiling oil can co-vaporize co with steam, with water, um, the ether can also co-vaporize with the propellant that it's in. So anyway, that's going to help with the separation. I have a glass tube on top of here also that'll help. And uh, remember that diethyl ether is extremely flammable. It has a uh, an auto ignition temperature of something like 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, it does not take much to set this stuff on fire, and it is very, very flammable. And fires of it can get out of control extremely quickly. So 
I always do this in a fume hood or outside or around things that you don't care about. Anyway, after the ether is in there, what's going to happen is I'll set this back up, I'll reconfigure the apparatus for a fractional distillation, and then we can just distill the ether off the heptanes, which have a significant difference in boiling points, and uh, that should be pretty easy to do. So, let me get the ether out of the freezer, and we can start. Okay, I have the ether out of the freezer. It's very cold, frosty. I'm going to stick the straw on the top. There we go. And I've got a paper towel to help me hold this because it is very, very cold. And I'm going to proceed to spray the entire can into the flask through this top piece here. Here we go. Just another reason why you have to be so careful. Watch the propellant vapors coming off the top of this tube. See the shimmers? That's extremely flammable. There we go, I just felt the last of the liquid leave. And this can is now Essentially empty, just a little bit of propellant left, I think. Let's see if we can get that out. Yeah. That's. That's everything. Okay. And I'm now going to replace this uh, gas adapter here with a stopper. And we will allow this to acclimate to room temperature, which should uh, remove the propellant and uh, leave us with just a mixture of the heavier boiling stuff. While I was waiting, I did an interesting experiment. I uh, made sure this was completely empty and I used a can opener to take the bottom off. And uh, you can see there's just a straw in there and it's a completely clean, dry, empty tube now. Uh, that might be interesting. You could maybe use that for something. This is a pretty thick steel can because of its uh, CO2 propellant, usually a higher pressure than a regular aerosol can. But uh, yeah, you could use it as a safe or something too. Store your cash in there, stick it on the garage shelf, and no one would even think about it. Hmm. So I've set up here for fractional distillation. You can see uh, it's the same thing as simple distillation. I just have this column in place here, which uh, helps the separation of, boiling, of compounds that have close boiling points. I've chosen a Friedrichs condenser because this is a fairly efficient condenser and it's already getting pretty cold. I've got ice water running through it, which is uh, colder, of course, than the standard tap water that I would normally use. And I need ice water for this, especially because the diethyl ether has such a, uh, a low boiling point. It's also why I have this bowl of ice water here uh, surrounding the collection flask, which uh, prevents a lot of the ether from escaping once it's collected and it maximizes the yield. Now you'll notice that uh, there's a boiling chip in here and it's already beginning to bubble a little bit and I don't even have the heating mantle turned on. And you can see the still head is only 16 Celsius, that's about the ambient temperature in here. The reason for this is uh, because the solution is acting sort of like a carbonated beverage where instead of carbon dioxide dissolved in water, it's uh, CO2 and uh, propane and isobutane dissolved in heptanes and diethyl ether. So that'll continue to happen, but these condensers aren't cold enough, or this condenser and this flask are not cold enough to uh, condense any of those three. So the next lowest fraction is what we will start to collect, which is diethyl ether, as soon as I turn the mantle on. So let's get started. getting our first drops now. You can see them running down the side of the flask there. Hydrocarbon vapors can be seen leaving the pipe. You see the disturbance in the density of the air. Extremely flammable. It's a propane and isobutane. Well, the product is now collecting at a fairly good pace, and uh, boiling this down. You can see the 
column is working efficiently by the way that the drips keep rolling down it. It should be refluxing to some degree in the column. That's uh, that's sort of the way it works, is the condensation and reboiling of stuff in the column. You never run a column too slow, really, as long as you're getting product out the top. You can, however, overdrive them, run them too fast, and uh, then you run into problems with separation. So, you, know, you can see this is pretty pretty much right in the ether range. It's uh, been hovering between 39 and, or sorry, 32 and 33. And uh, literature value, of course, is 34. Uh, 34.5 or 35.5 or something like that, but uh, the thermocouples aren't always that accurate. Coming along just fine. Well, the distillation has slowed down to a crawl here compared to what it once was. You can tell we've collected uh, something close to about what we should uh, the theoretical yield. If the can of ether was like 50%, it should be 210 milliliters of ether. Uh, but of course, there was loss and everything, the uh, outgassing of the propellant and all that. Um, We've slowed to a crawl in here too, and you can see there's a significant amount of reflux happening right now in this column, and that's uh, that's the heptane being rejected. And of course, the uh, the closer we get to having zero ether in this flask, the more heptane the uh, the column is going to have to reject, and thus the more heat it's going to have to reject. And because this column can only reject a certain amount of heat, um, it's very easy to overwhelm columns when you get near the end or near the breaking point of a uh, fractional separation like that. So you can see we're overwhelming it slightly. Our column is at uh, uh, like almost 40 C now and uh, our collection has pretty much stopped and uh, we're basically just refluxing this in that column now so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the distillation because uh, with every drop that we're putting in here we're adding a little bit of heptane right the concentration of heptane is now increasing since we've distilled off most of the ether and uh, we're only going to further contaminate the product by trying to push this any farther so I'll turn the heat off That said, uh, heptane in the ether is not going to affect it very much. It's not going to affect organic extraction. It's not going to affect a Grignard reaction. It's uh, pretty much inert and acts very much like uh, diethyl ether minus the slight solubility in water. So for extraction from starter fluid, uh, this quick and dirty sort of procedure is just fine and the purity is just fine. Um, if you're doing something that requires higher purity ether like a, I don't know, HPLC or something like that, you probably want to buy your ether, of course. but. Uh, for a uh, quick and dirty off the shelf for $11 or almost $12 a liter, this is extremely cheap. So the end result of the last uh, two, two and a half hours is uh, approximately 200 milliliters of a highly mobile, uh, very volatile liquid that is diethyl ether. It's got the characteristic heavy ether smell, it's very flammable, and it, uh, it's not very dense. It's uh, very much looks like chloroform, but is uh, doesn't quite feel like it. Anyway, this needs to get stored in an amber glass bottle because it does form peroxides on contact with air, and those peroxides are explosive, which will concentrate when you uh, distill this in the future. So I'll be covering that in another video, but I'll just put that little tidbit in here. Just read up, read up on what you're doing before you start doing any of this stuff. Uh, anyway, when we get this in the bottle. So here's something interesting. Uh, this flask contains a lot of heptane vapor, and when I put my cold thumb, or any finger for that matter, against the glass, you can see the uh, condensate roll away from my finger. See that? That's really cool. I don't know if you can see that. That's really neat looking about. That said, these heptanes aren't completely useless. You can uh, burn them as gasoline. Just pour them in the gas tank in the garage. That's not a big deal. Gasoline is pretty much mostly heptane anyway and various other hydrocarbons, but a little bit and a couple of gallons of gas isn't going to harm anything, and there's no sense in wasting it. In fact, its greenhouse potential is uh, a little is higher than the carbon dioxide that would otherwise be formed if you were to burn this. So if anything, go outside and burn it. Just be careful. It's really, really, really flammable. Um, you could just start a barbecue or something, too. I don't know. Use your imagination. The extreme flammability of diethyl ether is no joke. If I place some on this watch glass here, and uh, quickly before it evaporates, if I heat up a glass rod with a blowtorch here, and just the warm rod is enough to ignite the ether, oh, and it already flamed off because it's so volatile that most of it had already evaporated. But you can see uh, that if this were the surface of a hot plate or something, that could easily uh, catch fire to the whole apparatus.
that's about all I have for this evening. If you liked what you saw, please press the, uh, the like button, and uh, if you want to see more, press the subscribe button. If you leave me a comment, I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. I try to answer all my comments, so uh, please be patient. It might take me a while, but I do try. And uh, as always, thank you very much for watching.